it's interesting that not everybody that uses a substance actually becomes addicted to it. You know, sometimes as an addictionologist, actually more as a parent, I'd like to be able to say, you know, if you use cocaine, you're going to become addicted to it. That would be a lie. What is more true is that the more often you use cocaine, the more likely you are to become addicted to it. That would be the truth. But also, I don't have a really good way of predicting if you use cocaine, whether you'll become addicted versus if you use it versus if, if you use it. And for the most part, it has nothing to do with the home that you come from or the job that you have or how much money you have or for most substances even what gender you are. Um, culture can play a role in it based on genetics because genetics have everything to do with it and certain cultures are genetically more predisposed to different kinds of uh, dependencies. Uh, who your parents are has a lot to do with it. Uh, the studies of genetics and alcohol dependence are uh, sort of the, the most robust of the findings. So if you're working with a child who has one parent with alcohol dependence, their risk of developing alcohol dependence in comparison to a child that has no parents, four times. They are four times as likely to develop alcohol dependence. You say, well, it's environment, you know, if mom or dad gave them beer when they were 12, of course they're gonna develop alcohol dependence. No, if you take them away at birth, or if dad or mom is sober from the time they're born to the time they leave the house, they still have that fourfold increase in the risk of alcohol dependence just based on their genetics. And there's even some of Shuckett's work that's looked at a, a particular set of genes where if you have a particular set of genes, the risk approaches 100%. Why would that be important to identify? Well, if we actually knew whose chance was 100%, this is a disease that can't occur unless you're exposed. So just like you can't get tuberculosis without being exposed to tuberculosis, you can't develop alcohol dependence if you don't drink alcohol. Now, I don't know if that would change every adolescent's mind about whether they were gonna drink or not, but it certainly could be some powerful information. Could be that if you told a kid you were working with, look, you know, your risk is four times that might make a difference to a couple of kids. If both of your parents have alcohol dependence, it's six times. So important from the clinical perspective of letting people know that genetics has an incredible impact on whether you develop dependence, but also important in us understanding that this is a biologic disease. And we don't all come to the table with an even playing field. Some people come to the, the table with the genetic deck stacked against them. The same has been shown, not quite as many studies, not quite as robust, with opiates. So if you have a family member with opiate dependence, even more interesting, but again, still even less data, is if you have a parent with alcohol dependence or opiate dependence, there is some cross issue with increasing your risk to the other. So alcohol and opiates appear to be some of those substances which are linked genetically. And when we look at medications to treat alcohol dependence, we'll look at some more evidence that we know that alcohol and, and opiate uh, dependence must be related or that alcohol and the opiate receptor are important. With, with the genetic factors and then the environmental cultural factors, it's, it's, um, there is education and exposure mm -hmm. to, to Consequences because of genetic factors. Uh, could you comment on what, getting into other things that I was necessarily alcohol, but other kinds of maladaptive behavior that's very destructive, like workaholism and or just really extreme behaviors? Is that sure? So the question has to do with, let's say there's a parent or two parents with alcohol dependence. Does that mean something to the child in terms of other compulsive behaviors or other addictions? 
Is that the question? And the answer is yes. Now, do we have as much data as we'd like there? No, we don't have as much data as we'd like, but it certainly increases the risk of obsessive compulsive disorder. It increases the risk of mood and anxiety disorders, but with the mood and anxiety disorders, it's less clear if that's an issue of growing up in a home where addiction is an issue or whether that's a straight genetic issue. Um, my own experience in uh, working with people who have issues around food is that there may be a correlation between parents with alcohol dependence and children that develop uh, binge eating disorders or compulsive overeating. So some cross there. Um, there is, as I mentioned, sort of if it's alcohol dependence, it increases your risk of other dependencies. One important thing to try and think about in terms of genetics is that there's different ways a disease can be inherited. So a disease can be inherited because one gene has gone wrong or, or is different. One example is Huntington's disease. So Woody Guthrie had Huntington's disease, a movement disorder where later on in his life he developed these abnormal movements. He then developed the brain problems that go along with it and he died. His son, Arlo Guthrie, had a 50-50 chance of getting the single gene that decides whether or not you're gonna have Huntington's disease. Fortunately, uh, Woody Guthrie doesn't have Huntington's disease but that decision was made by a single gene. Let's look at diabetes and high blood pressure. So my husband and I have similar environments in which we eat too much and don't exercise enough. <laughs> my family is filled with people with high blood pressure and his family is filled with people with diabetes. Well, guess what? I've had some issues with high blood pressure and he's had some issues with diabetes. So the environmental factors are the same, but we came to this life with a different genetic load. And my load is that tendency towards high blood pressure and his load is that tendency towards diabetes. Going back to adult onset diabetes, so environment is important and genes are important, but there isn't a single gene. We can't go look at my husband's or anybody else's genetic makeup and say, oh, yep, there's the problem, there's that adult onset diabetic gene, and that's what's responsible. There are many genes which, depending on how many of them you have and how they interact, are gonna determine your individual risk for adult onset diabetes. The same is true of addiction. We haven't found, and it doesn't look like we're gonna find, one gene that says, oh, yep, addictive disorder. We're gonna find a dozen or so genes that increase and another dozen or so genes that decrease one's risk of developing an addictive disorder. And so I'm gonna find people who are able to inject heroin twice a month. I think that's a little crazy, but it doesn't meet the criteria for addiction and something's different. Something's different about the way their body and brain respond to heroin. Same thing is true of alcohol. So the majority of people who drink alcohol who are exposed to this substance don't develop alcohol dependence, but some do. That is largely related to genetic factors, but it's also related to environmental factors. And because you do so much work with children and adolescents, I'll share with you the most important environmental factor, and that is the age at first drunk. So the age at which a child becomes drunk for the first time is very important to their risk of developing alcohol dependence and sort of the course of their alcohol dependence over time. So if you remember, we can go back to a couple slides ago and remember, amphetamine's getting all the way up there at 1,000. And here in this picture, food's getting up a little above 150 and sex to 200. It's possible that those people who develop a dependence on sex 
or food, that one of the deficits is that if we could measure the dopamine in their brain, their dopamine levels in response to sex would be much higher than the normal response to sex. So that's one possible neurobiologic explanation for why some processes like sex or gambling can lead to addiction. It's possible in some people that the dopamine goes up in response to those events in a non-typical way. Yes? So I don't know if this really matters, but on the, the idea about the age of uh, first intoxication, mm -hmm. so would that be correlated, highly correlated with the environmental factors? Sure. I mean, so the question has to do with this important risk factor that I just told you about in terms of age at first drunk is also going to be correlated with some other environmental risk factors. And here we can't say that it's that you got intoxicated at 11 is the reason why you developed alcohol dependence, but it does appear to be a marker that may go along with other markers. There's a lot of uh, data, epidemiological data, that if you actually start using in a regular fashion, meaning six, monthly at least, uh, for six consecutive months before the age of 15, you're much more likely to go on to develop dependence by the time you're in your young 20s as opposed to starting after 15. Right. And part of that's probably genes and environment. Probably part of that's the actual development of the brain at that stage. There's some things related to pre- and postsynaptic dopamine and a whole range of other things we can talk about later that right. probably play into that in addition to the environment. Early we t earlier, we talked about that frontal part of the brain where judgment is developed and how a lot of that development happens during adolescence. So if you're regularly drinking before that can develop, that's going to change sort of your risks. So the interesting thing is that's actually been shown in animal models, too, to be true. So it's not just human. It's across several different mammalian species. Yeah, when you get a, drunk, a rat drunk early, it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is all great. Could that have that, that first drunk and that early drunk stage have something to do with, you know, the, the memory, the, the body's, the somatic memory <coughs> that people experience as a setup of, you know, right. like wanting more and on development, you're not quite at some places yet, and probably more susceptible for the long run to have an alcohol problem. But to me, the thing is, a HEPA, you know, the example, the early on experience mm -hmm. setting you up memory-wise, for, for more experiences, that, that's what process my Are you reading ahead? No. <laughs> so we're going to talk about memory and why memory might be important in addiction. <laughs> College age. Mm -hmm. That's often when they start drinking because the party before. Mm -hmm. What about the brain at that point? That's sure. 18 years well, earlier. Right, so college age varies, and obviously, you know, the younger you are, the, the less time you've had to um, develop. I mean, college drinking is pr probably a little more important from an environmental standpoint, and our tendency now to create college campuses that uh, promote, condone, allow binge drinking. And binge drinking, um, although it's definitely a concern for uh, the future risk of alcohol dependence, uh, is actually most concerning. When I was in medical school, people would talk about the J-shaped curve of alcohol dependence. And I, I don't have a, a blackboard, but I'm going to try and draw it out in the air here. So it turns out if you look at all people of all ages and alcohol consumption, and this is not drinking, and this is uh, drinking one or two a day. And as you go up the slope, you're drinking more and more and more. Um, all comers, if you drink one or two drinks a day, it looks like their mortality is less. That's all comers. That doesn't say anything about the individual. But on a population basis, alcohol seems to convey some, some benefit. Well, if you look at college age kids, and drinking, there's no J-shaped curve there. Every drink you have increases your risk of mortality. So that is not the age at which the J-shaped curve applies. It's not the age at which it matters whether your heart is seeing any alcohol or not. And we could talk about whether it ever matters that your heart is seeing alcohol or not. 
but at the college age, the risk of trauma and other sort of sequelae of drinking is, is the biggest problem from a public health standpoint. And you don't need to be alcohol dependent to die of an alcohol-related issue when you are that age or any age. 